It's never going to be easy. And if you don't manage your expectations, it's a lot harder to stay disciplined and work at it because you just think it's going to be something that it's not. I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Monty Douglas, the first British female Olympian winter and summer. How have you found routine like being such a big part of your everyday life? It's a hard graph, but you can't be motivated all the time, but you have to be disciplined. And that's the difference. Motivation can come and go because I'm looking in the mirror going, is that a history maker? If it isn't, if I'm not sleeping like one, if I'm not eating like one, if I'm not training like one, then what makes me think that I'm gonna even get there? And that's all you have to do to yourself. And if you can't be honest with yourself in those moments, then actually you're probably not gonna achieve it anyway. Yeah. And it's just gonna set yourself up to failure. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to say a big thank you to Casita Properties, the UK leading property company when it comes to off-market discreet buy-to-let sales. All their links will be in the description below. Now, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Monty Douglas, the first British female Olympian winter and summer. Pat on my back. Pat on your back. <laughs> Pat on my back. There was many takes before that. Monty, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Oh, thanks. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. Well, I, I can't wait to dive into your journey and find out a little bit more. But for those who don't yet know you, just give us a quick like 30 second overview of who you are and what you do. 30 seconds, the last 20 years. Uh, no, essentially, <laughs> I'm an athlete. I've been an athlete for about 20 years. Um, I've also done mentoring with kids and I'm interested in property. I'm, I'm honestly a jack of all trades, but I can specialise in a couple of things, which is the 100 metres and bobsleigh. <laughs> They're essentially the things that I've done the best so far. Awesome. Well, you've got an awesome Instagram page. It, it shows an awesome case study of what you've done, who you are and what you're about. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's a lot more to it. And what I want to do is I just want to take it back, starting from your childhood, what life looked like, where you grew up, any hardship, any hurdles you had to jump and sort of eventually we're going to get to this stage to where you are now and, and also some of these new ventures which are really exciting. I know we've been on some lives together and stuff like that. So, you know, you've got other interests, but where did it all begin for Monty? Gosh, it began pretty much actually in, in South London um, in a park with not much grass. As you know, if you know South London, it's like concrete jungle. Um, and I pretty much was just cutting around, um, chasing tennis balls and my dad playing tennis. I, don't, I didn't play tennis at all, but that was my earliest memories when I was about two years old. Um, but I was always really sporty. I loved doing sport. I loved playing out. It was, you know, this is like in the 90s playing out. So going out with friends was the thing. Um, but doing lots of different sports, I was an all boy football team when I was 10 years old because there weren't girls football teams around back, back then. <laughs> Loved doing that and then went to secondary school and did athletics and basketball, all boy basketball team again. Um, it just, it was a theme of my life to be honest. Yeah. And that. Um, yeah, I've just done sport ever since. And I kind of, it kind of took off from when I was 16. I became a double, double sprint national champion in 100 and 200 meters, um, number one. And then six years later, I was at, I was at my first Olympic games. It's incredible. I mean, obviously you've been destined for sport from day one then. That's obviously very clear. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I didn't, it didn't, it, I didn't always think it was going to be that way, to be honest. Um, when I was younger, like my parents were really young where they had me, um, they were almost teenagers and everyone kind of worked from 16. Everyone went to work straight away. So that's all I knew. I didn't know anything else. Um, so my journey when I was younger, I wanted to, first of all, like see the world. So originally, actually, I really wanted to be an air hostess. Because I don't know if you air hostess have the greatest job of just telling you, like, <laughs> exit on the right and exit on the left. <laughs> yeah. I just love that. Uh, but not just because I love that, because I wanted to see the world. I wanted to get out of Catford. I wanted to get out of Lucian. Um, and it just so happened that my sport at 16 took me on my first ever plane ride. So I was literally getting paid to fly on a different country, compete for my nation, um, to run in a straight line. And I thought, wow, this is <laughs> this is pretty sick. This is all right. And then I just can continue doing it um, up until my, my junior age and through university and stuff. It's amazing. Well, what we are going to touch on is uh, sport, I think, especially disciplined sport. To be really good at a high level, I think, moulds you. It stays with you. It can play you know, into your future businesses, ventures, you know, discipline and routine are pretty much the key to most things being successful, especially being consistent. Yeah. But, 
you know, was, was life good when you were growing up? You know, did, th you know, your childhood, did that help mold you? Like what were your parents like when you were growing up? Yeah. So my parents had very different ways of raising me. Um, so they both, like I said, worked really hard. My dad used to be a delivery driver. So, you know, not your Amazon, but he used to work for the companies that used to do deliver carpets and towels, but he'd pick me up from school in this big truck. And he was very much the kind of a pusher for me. He was like, kind of get on with it. And he taught me resilience. He's the number one reason why I'm resilient because my mum kind of was like, do everything for for me. She would wanna, she'd help me clean my room, she'd help me do stuff. But she also taught me that if I was ever gonna do a job, I would do it properly. Mm. Now at the time I was obviously hoovering my room. So I think she was just like, if you're gonna do a job, do it properly, make sure I get every <laughs> nook and cranny. But um, it taught me to just go hard at everything I did. So I almost became a natural perfectionist. Um, so much so that actually when I was, first time going to school. So I went to, to school actually in Bromley in Kent, which was about an hour and a half to two hour bus ride from where I lived in Catford because they wanted me to get out of the area. And my mum was like, you're not going to this school down here, you're going to Bromley. And I'd never seen my school before. So I hadn't even gone to visit it or anything. And I didn't know how to get there. And my mum wanted to take me on in a car on the first day of school as an 11 year old to secondary school. My dad was like, nah, leave her, she'll find her way. <laughs> so there's me on a bus in Catford, get on the bus where like everyone kind of looks like me, talks like me. No one's in my school uniform. About an hour in my journey, everyone's in my school uniform. And there's different people that don't look like me, do not talk like me. And then about half an hour down, like some people getting off the bus. And I'm just like, I don't even know where to get off the bus because I don't know where I'm going. And then I kind of think, mm, there's some people still on the bus in my uniform. So then I actually then con continue to stay on the bus and see the other people then get off about two stops later. And that's when I got off the bus, thought this might be the stop. Got off the bus, walked down the hill and there was my school. That's how I got to my first day of school at 11 years old, traveling for two hours. So my dad taught me the resilience. My mum taught me how to graft. Yeah, that's like, you know, it's very similar to my parents. My dad has always been the grafter, bring the money in and just no matter what, that's what he'll do. Like guarantee. And he, he was very much kind of like, I enjoyed sport. They never really pushed me to do it. And my mum was always the voice of reason, you know, always the one with the plan, always the one that you could go to emotionally and stuff like that. And that's a, quite a nice balance for us to, uh, to take into sort of adulthood and stuff like this. But sport is massive for discipline, isn't it? And even in tying into like health and everything like that, which we'll get into, which is a big part. But when you knew that, sport was a big part. Did you find that it distracted you from school? Because the thing is for me, and I've spoken about it in other videos, you know, to do with all this formal education and stuff, but, um, and self-education, but I, I was so heavy into sport, especially football and athletics that I almost thought, I don't really need to worry about English. I don't need to worry yeah. about geography. I know where I'm going. Why do I need to see it on a map? <laughs> did you, did you find that where you were so into sport, you almost just weren't concerned about you know, academics. To be honest, for me, I was always I was always a natural academic because I think there's like a seven year gap between me and my brother. And when my mum had me, she's put a lot of just work into me. I think that like she would read me a, a Disney story every night to the point where she tried to skip a page and I, I'd, I'd be asleep and I'd open one eye and be like, you missed the page because she was tired, obviously. Yeah. I would just know because I read a lot. I was really academic naturally. Right. But there, it wasn't kind of a, an intentional thing because my family hadn't done it. But it also meant that it was really important for me to keep that part of me there. So that was one of the reasons why, obviously, I went off to university because being a student athlete is is no joke. I actually graduated the day after I made the Olympic Games. So you can imagine my third year of university. I had opportunity to go to LA to train for four weeks in preparation for the Olympic Games. And I had to sacrifice that and be like, because there's no way. Who's going to LA? Think about dissertation. Yeah. No one. You're going shopping, you're chilling out, you're enjoying, I'm training hard. But I had to sacrifice that as part of my journey to make the game because I just couldn't concentrate on my studies while I was doing doing yeah. my sport. And it was that distraction, but I chose the academic because I knew that actually no one had done that before in my family. Like no one in my whole lineage, like mom, dad, they didn't have been to university. I'm the first person ever from my whole history <laughs> that I've been to university before. And it was important for me just to say, that's a tick box. But I also think it helped me stay grounded in my sport mm. because I was not so drilled and focused and, and getting antsy about making sure that this was just performance based. It allowed me to not take everything so seriously because you know, people go to university first year, they're like tense. It's like first year doesn't even count. <laughs> and then third year I did that and then third year, I just was like, this is long. I'm yeah. just going to relax, enjoy myself. And then I literally made my first games. It's crazy, isn't it? See, when I hear you talk about uni, I've heard a lot of people say that where they get to sort of their final years and it's almost like, 
oh, I'm over it. Yeah. And and this yeah. is this is kind of my you argument are. is that yeah. with university, it's just that I think it really comes down to the individual. I think if you go to university and you're someone that says, I'm going to apply and no matter what, I'm coming out of this with everything that I want. Just but isn't that the same as outside life? Not going to uni. If I want something, there's it's a non-negotiable. I'm gonna get it. And I just think what the answer is when people are like, you can't say this, you can't say that. I don't agree. I don't dis uh, or I do agree, whatever. It's a mindset thing. Yeah. Like no one's going to tell me just because I haven't got paperwork, I can't do it. Of course. Yeah. So I think it's a mindset thing. But the fact that you've been in such a high level of sport and athletics, it just sets you above the rest in terms of discipline and, and routine. Because I think so many people go... I'll go tomorrow. Yeah. I'll go tomorrow. But the thing is, yeah. opportunity might have been that day. You know, I mean, how have you found routine, like being such a big part of your everyday life yeah. from childhood to now? Well, it, it's massive. I didn't even realise how big it was, to be honest, until I even even came back for the Winter Games in February. <laughs> that just having the routine of when you're going, especially like if you're retiring out of sport, getting to the routine of today, I'm not actually going to be going to the track. I'm not going to go train because you don't have to. It's weird. It'd be like just today, someone saying to you, you don't need to do that. You'd be like, well, what else am I going to do? You yeah. literally are just a bit a bit lost because you're like, well, yeah. this is all I, I know. Because a lot of the time I always get, and, and now it's really difficult, especially younger athletes in their 20s, teenagers, they feel like 25, they're past it. And because they've got this instant gratification, they've always want things now. It's hard to see the longevity of sport in, term, in terms of, look, you're not going to be maybe Olympian into your late 20s maybe and some of them are like what I'm 18 now I've got 10 more years I'm like yeah you do because it's a hard graph but you can't be motivated all the time but you have to be disciplined and that's the difference motivation can come and go no one wants to get up 7 a.m the crack of dawn to be running up hills when it's wet and it's muddy in a, in a forest that's what I was doing on, on yeah. Saturday morning I could have just been having a lion but I wasn't doing that no one wants to do that but did I realise that if I didn't do it, that I wouldn't achieve my goal? Absolutely, yes. So then it, it became a, an easy decision for me because I held myself accountable for my goals. Basically. Yeah. But then from the outside, people are going to look at you and think, easy work. Yeah. Well, you know, it was easy for her. And I think people are so quick to make quick judgments of someone else's su success because I don't think they want to admit that hard work goes into it. I had a comment saying on one of my videos saying that starting a business is hard and it's extremely risky. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. It is. But I'm willing to go through the process because the process and the reward is so much fulfilling than just going along with the, well, what am I going to do today? I'm wait you know, that's why a lot of soldiers suffer from PTSD yeah. and like and struggles when they come outside because no one's saying, wake up, put your pants on. Like it's a case of no one's telling me what to do. It's like but it's the people that can go. I don't feel in the mood. It is rainy. It's muddy, but I'm going to do it regardless because yeah. it's going to put me in condition. It's going to keep me in a headspace, which kind of wants me. Uh, it, it makes me want to sort of talk about the world that we live in at the moment. How did you find going into the public eye, being known, perhaps people from your childhood, like people you grew up with that went different directions, you know, judgment? In the public eye, have you had a lot of that? You know, where people go, oh, Monty, I used to know her. Look at her now. Yeah. Like, do you, have you had that before? I think, to be honest, uh, well, thankfully, not huge amounts of negative negativity in terms of, I think, for, for, if I'm, I, I think myself personally, I, I'm, a, I'm a realist. Like, I keep it 100% real with everyone. Like, you might not like what you hear, <laughs> but if you ask me a question, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I yeah. think that humility, but also just that sincerity. I'm just gonna say how it is. I've had that my whole life and I've never sugarcoated anything because I've always, I'm so, it, I'm from humble beginnings, like yourself, that there's no reason for me to feel superior or, or bigger than anyone else. Like this is, I'm, this is almost like happenstance for me. I'm like, I, I just have, they're like, well, it's easy for you. Happy to, I'm like, I've had to work really hard because although I was pretty good, like I said to you, I was a national, like a national junior champion. But when I look actually at my rankings and my all time list, I did it actually the other day because one of my, the coaches was saying to me, oh, I was really good junior. And I was like, actually, if I look at my rankings, there I was like 28, 29, 30 in the country. That might sound so, so, still good. But considering I'm ranked, I was number one at one point and now I'm ranked third of all time. It shows that actually when I was younger and I had a bit of talent, 
the talent there didn't give me everything. I had to work because 20th, 29th is pretty decent. But now I'm third of all time, whereas then I was like at 16, there were still 28 girls ahead of me at that age group of all time that run faster than me, for example, but they're not there at the top which makes a, a difference and it, it, it kind of highlights then, okay, what's the difference between that? Just do it. <laughs> and we're just going to uh, take a quick break. We're going in- to we're gonna include that in there. We are. <laughs> I think I did mention to someone to take it off. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that in there, but the studio is actually <laughs> going to give us a free recording. <laughs> Time, so. <laughs> tell them off. Tell them off after telling them. Monty, right. I can only apologise for the lack of professionalism from the studio. I've been a start line when someone's like, Shh. yeah, Olympic Games, 90,000 people, and someone's like, <laughs> go on, money. <laughs> And we're like, you can't do that now because people are about to start. They're going to full start. This is their dream. <laughs> we're going to leave all that in there. <laughs> but yeah, sorry, you were saying. No, yeah. So I feel like it, like, what I was saying, it's just, it's kind of different for everybody. I feel like the where you're going to get to, how you get to something, it very much depends on how you start and then where you want to to get to. But it's, it's never going to be easy. And if you don't manage your expectations, which I always say for me is key, you can dream as big as you want. If you don't manage the expectations and think you're going to, it's going to be like this, it's a lot harder to stay disciplined and work at it because you just think it's going to be something that it's not. And in the end, you're just, you're just falling yourself. So it becomes difficult. Whereas if I say, right, um, a coach once said to me, if you had told me that you wanted to go and run 12 seconds, this conversation would be very different. He said, but that's not what you want to run. And I was like, no. He's like, you're trying to run like 10 seconds. So that therefore the co- level of conversation we have is at that 10 seconds, which means I'm going to be accountable for your sleep, your eating, when you're going to, to, are you going out? Your lifestyle then becomes different. Then someone is like, if you're going to go run that time at that level, then we don't have to talk about that because you're already kind of there. But if you want to do something you've never done before that most people have never done before, you're going to have to do something completely different. I am so pleased you've just brought this up because your take on that in in the sport industry applies to absolutely everything. I have said this numerous amounts of time. So when people, there's always this one person that will say, I'm not changing for anyone. Yeah. And it's that person that holds themselves back because when I talk about, uh, especially like if we're talking about finance or something like that, to talk to someone who is turning over a business uh, and wants to move money or wants to make an investment of 10 million pounds. There is a different conversation from talking with someone who has a hundred thousand pounds to then someone who wants to move 10 million pounds. And your conversation has to change. Right. Yeah. You have to get in the right mindset for that conversation. Just like you, if you want to run 10 seconds, why are you talking like you're a 12 second runner? Mm-hmm. So, but there are a lot of people that say, well, I'm not going to wear that hat because I want to be me. Well, you need to level up and evolve. You need to go from freaking Pikachu to Raichu or whatever that second one is. <laughs> that second time I brought up Pokemon, not a big fan. I don't know why I brought that up. But the point is you have to level up, which is all that self-development, self-improvement. And that's um, if you want more, you've always got to improve, right? Yeah, you definitely hit hit the nail on the head and totally agree with what you're saying about being able to level up yourself. and He's still laughing about Pikachu, right? Sorry. I, <laughs> quite, I, I, be able to, I had to say that because otherwise I was going to laugh. <laughs> I don't want you thinking I'm laughing at you. <laughs> He's checking up. He's like, love it. I do watch it. I don't even watch yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, don't um, about I think like just what you're saying, if you don't level up yourself, then that's fine. Because I would say to people, well, that's fine. Because if you don't, if you don't want to go there, then you do understand you're not going to get there. Everyone has a choice. Remember, it's just like you said with university. It's just like you say with business. The risk and reward is always there. Just like me trying. If I didn't try to achieve something, like in breaking British history, it's not easy because it's never been done before. If something hasn't been done before, you can't expect to be the same person mm. because you have to look in the mirror and say, is the person that I'm looking at. Is that the reflective of the person that I'm trying to be? Because I'm looking in the mirror going, is that a history maker? If it isn't, if I'm not sleeping like one, if I'm not eating like one, if I'm not training like one, then what makes me think that I'm going to even get there? And that's all you have to do to yourself. And if you can't be honest with yourself in those moments, then actually you're probably not going to achieve it anyway. Yeah. And it's just going to set yourself up for failure. It's like when people talk about risk. I have so many comments from people with, with business and stuff like that. And they say, well, it's such a massive risk to start a business or do stuff like that. And even in the sport, industry you mitigate risk in every way possible like when you 
go for a job or an interview or anything like that, are you not mitigating the risk by failing that interview, by preparing, dressing nicely? Like everything's preparing. If you're going to run 100 meters, are you not stretching and warming up before? You're There's still a risk that you're going to pull a hamstring or something like that, yeah. but you mitigate the risk. And I think it just gets lost in translation when people don't believe because they haven't seen it or they haven't felt it. If, some, if you try and turn around to someone and say, you could earn a hundred grand this year, they're like, that's not even possible because they haven't seen it. They haven't felt no. it. They haven't, they haven't been involved in it. They're not, they're not having those 10 second conversations rather than running in 12 seconds, you know, stuff like yeah. that. And I think it's just, you know, I like the whole, should a bee really be able to fly? Well, should a bee really be able to fly? Look well, how small its wings are. Yeah, mechanically. But mechanically. maybe the bee flies because it has no idea. Thanks. No one's <laughs> no one's turned round to the bee and said the bee cannot fly. You watch that. That's a one million view on TikTok. It is. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, the bee has tiny wings. The bee has a big body. <laughs> this is totally. But you see what yeah. I mean? Like, no, as, yeah. as long as you, like you said, if it's never been done before, people almost write it off. Yeah. And when you go and do it, they're like, oh, I might have been able to do it. Yeah, because it's always got to be like the, the old age old saying is it's always impossible until it's done. And that is key because even if it's something within your own remit, this doesn't have to be something like record breaking, ground breaking. Oh, my gosh, it's like big. It could be something small within yourself. Like, oh, when I went to university it was one of the reasons why I said it was so prominent for us is that my aunt then this was in her late 30s at the time. She went back to university. I mean, I mean back, she never went before because she said to me, the reason why I went to university was because I always wanted to be a midwife, always. But I didn't think that us and our family were smart enough to do it. And she said, and because you did it, it made me think, oh, yeah. Monty did it. Then maybe I can. She went in and she's midwife. And just having those beliefs, that small belief and the limiting belief is humongous. But if you just, like you said, level up and rise above it and think, well, how, how do I be better to achieve it? Rather than saying, well, I can't, you just say, well, how can I <laughs> basically get there? Yeah. In order to achieve more, in order to go up, you need to see up, you need to hear it, you need to visualize it. And that's why, you know, people who live in the, the back of Wales or, you know, we got, we know people who live in Ireland, they live in small little villages and they're like, there's no motivation, but you know, you can't help but go into central London, look around you and just be inspired. And I think unless you can have that sort of mindset to think, you know what, there is a possibility. A lot of people just write it off because you know, mentally, they just don't believe it's possible, which also is massive for sport and fitness because you like releasing endorphins all the time. It's like a reflection phase. It's if you're healthy, you're in good condition. In my opinion, you are far above anyone else mentally because just of how tough it is. If you are tough on your body, you will be tough in business. You will be yeah, I just think you're ruthless and you're you're a you're a force to be reckoned with. And obviously, being your whole life in sport, going and running, what does it do? It releases endorphins. Like mentally, that's yeah. such a good place to be in, isn't it? Yeah, the the transferable skills, is what yeah. I like to call it, and it is. It's like life transferable skills because you come out of a lot of athletes might come out, and even people that have just done sport their whole life, and it becomes a lifestyle rather than it being than your profession or, or sport because you use all those things everyday life. I've seen it now with business in corporate, just just all different avenues where actually the skill sets I've had to me are so normal, but people will do like, you, they'll do courses. They'll even do university degrees <laughs> on the stuff <laughs> uh, uh, to develop the skills that I've done over time because I've had to do that and learn those things. And you've had to fail. You didn't always, you know what I mean? You can't win every single one of them. But like you said, it's it's mitigating those, it's mitigating that risk and saying, well, how can I make sure that I'm in the best position possible? A lot of people used to ask me all the time, so, you know, why do you do what you do? And my answer was always, why not? Because for me, it just, it was almost like, what else would I be doing? They're like, well, don't you want to do this? I had a friend of mine who very recently came back from every single championship this year, European, World and Commonwealth Games, went to Tokyo last year and his family is now still pressuring them to, to quit and to, to retire. And I was just like, well, asking, well, what do you want to do? You know, there's a lot of pressure. What, do you want, what, what are you going to do then? Like, I don't know, you know, do something else, like go and be a lawyer or something. And I was like, okay, so those people over there are telling you to do X because it suits their re reality their of life. The, yeah, everything. Right. I said, do not go and speak. You wouldn't go and speak to your butcher about getting your teeth done. 
So be very, very careful and make sure you're going to your dentist to get your dental work done and going to get your meat done for your butcher because you're talking to the wrong, the wrong people in the room and you have to be very careful about that in any walk of life to make sure you're getting good advice and good support around you. Absolutely love that. And there is, there's a little back off from that. It's like the saying of, you know, we've got financial advisors. Why would you pull up to a financial advisor's office in a Tesla, take advice when he's driving a Skoda? It's just, it's logic. It's just looking, feeling, and just making up your own mind. You know, the whole sheep yeah. versus the shepherd. Like, are you going to be the sheep? You're going to be the shepherd. Just like making up your own mind. You, you, you wouldn't take money advice of someone who has less money. You wouldn't, yeah. you know... I, you're not going to take a hundred meter advice from me. It's just not going to happen, is it? You know, it, so I think you just need to be picky on who you take advice from and actually value your your time because that's yeah. the other thing. Is as as I've gotten older, I have learned that I don't need to go for every coffee because you know a coffee meeting someone and stuff like it takes a few hours and you, you know you walk away. Someone might be nice, but essentially it's about. You know, how best to leverage, we were talking off camera, weren't we? You know, you, there's no point just coming to do one podcast yeah. because time freedom is the most important thing. And, you know, we're all working towards hopefully buying time back in some weird yeah, way. Sure. Um, so it's, it's so important. I want to ask your experiences of social comparison, because let's face it, everyone in the world, even to the point where I actually had a chat with my old dear the other day and she went, gosh, it's a tough life we live in at the moment, isn't it? I mean, bearing in mind, she's not on any socials and she's saying that. And I'm like, mum, try and move on to socials. I mean, I think she's on Facebook. But, you know, waking up every morning and not saying hello to your partner or loved ones and stuff like that and scrolling yeah. and looking at the Dubai lifestyle, looking at sunny beaches, ripped bodies, you know, good food, Rolexes. Like, it's really tough. Yeah. Have you been through your own experiences of comparison yeah and of course naturally I think if I look back and go back and come forward when I was in the prime of what I was doing I was plastered all over the national papers that's where it was so 2008 I broke the British record and then it's you know you got the paper the Guardian these people putting the independent bit just putting out there whereas now that would have been BBC Sport Post, some people posting different things up and putting a Twitter post up, which is what happened. The Winter Games, it was just kind of different reach. There was always was going to be pros and cons with the world we live in. The, the, the struggle is, is that a lot of us, people in general, and a lot younger than me, aren't equipped to deal with the world that we live in because they haven't gone through the stages of that, the resilience, the building, the adversity, to, to, to develop the social skills, to then manage things like scrolling, manage things like social comparison, understanding that this is not microwave success. It's not always gonna be like instant and then ping is, is perfect. You are now in an age where you can go on, I could go on a dating show right now and come out and I'll have a million followers in six weeks time. Yeah. That is the reality of what we live in, but it's not for everyone. It's like looking at in sport and looking at the Usain Bolts or people in, in our um, world, you see that and think, oh, he's set for life, they're set for life. He is like the greatest of all time, but also like the 0.01% of the athletic population. So you can get a really skewed kind of perception of what it could, what success looks like, because it looks different for everyone. But also if you kind of manage, if you balance yourself against that all the time and compare, yourself against all the time then you're always going to be a failure it's always about thinking where am I right now where do I see myself going to be what's going to make me feel more comfortable and how can I just build myself slowly towards that point but it is about you managing how long it's going to take to get there it's honestly this is really important talk, talking topics because it's it's like there, there are really big figures out there Mm. There is no point us comparing ourselves to Gary V, to Dan Penner, to Grant Cardone, to all these billionaires, because it's very unlikely we're ever going to become a billionaire. So what good is it going to do us taking segments or t taking a lifestyle of a billionaire and trying to Im implement that into our life? And like you say, it's, it doesn't work. So we have to, everyone's life is different. Everyone's perspective of success is different. So that's the problem though. We are in a world where... We're looking at other people's lives and we're thinking, is that how mine should be? Is that what I enjoy? And, and almost forgetting about themselves. And that's why it's so important to be a creator and not a consumer. Now, mm. when it comes to comparison and the negative effects, because it puts people in like really dark holes. Yeah. Like a lot of people waste a, a lot of their own life because they literally can't, you know, we had a guest on here who was, who was talking about taking his own life because he was in such a dump thinking, 
I shouldn't be where where I should. And you touched on age earlier. This is another thing. I'd love to know who made this up. Who made up the fact, uh, so who made up this timeline yeah. that we should have this by this, this by this, this by this. What, what's your take killer. on, what's your take on that? I mean, it is, it's a killer, literally, like you just said, it is a killer because the world we live in or our, say our even parents and my parents are pretty young. Because remember, they're damn young. They're pretty young in terms of generations. And then my nan's even that next generation and she's still young. But c considering. And when you look at what they were able to achieve, even them with very little, it's very different <laughs> to what we can achieve now. So the average ages of, you know, for example, people getting their own property or moving first-time buyers, that also depends on where you live and how much income you have. Living in London, as I live in London, I have my whole life. When I'm looking at, I was looking at the average salary for a long time. It was saying 25, 27 to, for so long. So I was thinking that was the average salary, but I'm like, hang a second, I'm not in the average place. I cannot compare being on average salary living in London because yeah. you are on poverty line. If you do earn the average salary in the UK and you live in London, you're on the poverty line because it's it's a completely different world. The same thing with Acquiring, like acquiring assets or just the job that you're in or the space you're in. And like you said, so comparison with 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 cars and stuff. Right before I've got a new car when I came back from the games, I was like, I didn't have a car at all because I'd given it back. I was um, grinding for a while without sharing a car and partner. And then I was like, I'm going to get a car. And I actually wanted a, a big SUV car that I wanted. And I was, I was like, my next, that's going to be an X1. And I'm grown, like I'm grown. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to tell you about eight. <laughs> and I was like, I looked at him, did the numbers. I'm like, I can't afford this. <laughs> I actually can't afford this. And not that I can't afford it. I would be putting myself a disservice by doing this because I want, I feel that now in my late thirties, I should be doing that. Now me, I'm like, well, you should, because do you have the resources to do that? Yes. Could I, do I have the resources to be able to make money in that sense to income where I would be able to transfer that into my life? Yes. So that's kind of my goal myself. Like, actually I want to be here. This is where I want to be. But I thought, let me get this. And then I reset my goal and said that, well, when I have my babies, <laughs> I was like, two years time, <laughs> when I've got married and I have my children, I was like, I'm getting that SUV. So then I set myself the two year plan. I said to her, when can I give this car back? And she was like, minimum two years should be the thing. So I was like, in two years, then I'm going to set myself a goal where I can then get passive, I can get, say, passive income. But if I can make investments that can give me the income that is going to pay for that, that car that I want to afford. That's very different than when I was growing up. My parents, my mum bought, drove BMWs my whole life, by the way. My dad drove a Golf my whole life. They just loved those two cars. <laughs> I literally... Both German. Both <laughs> German cars. And I'm not even in that space. And they both, I, I, grew, and I wouldn't say we didn't have any money, but we had two cars in a household. They had their own house. That is, that people like that now are loaded. That's, that's someone who's quite comfortable and well off. You've got a couple of cars in the house. You've got, everyone's got their own room in the house and, and you've got good jobs. And everyone's, that's quite a well off, quite standard family and thing. It's very different now. And having that comparison, it can be very dangerous. Yeah, and you don't know people's backstories. Like we look on social media and it looks like someone's doing very well. They're not going to announce that mummy and daddy were rich. They're not going to announce right. they were given inheritance. They, you know, not given, but came into inheritance or even given inheritance. People don't announce that because they want to portray the hustle lifestyle yeah. because the hustle lifestyle brings in customers. It brings in clients. It's more respected than turning around and going, by the way, all my photos have actually been funded. You didn't know, but the, the photo was being taken by mum. Like, you know, people don't want to say that because it's it's people prefer the rags to riches stories but that's what is what you said at the beginning be open be transparent and be be as real as they come i would say and just to finish on with schooling isn't it so strange that we're teaching all these subjects that we never really use mm -hmm. rather than how to deal with mental health, how to deal with the effects, good and bad of social media, how to brush your teeth, how to look after yourself, how to how to diet, yeah. how to live longevity like how to look after your body so you can have a good life. And we don't, we don't learn any of it. And I just think, you know, that sits behind an agenda. What's your take on that? 100%. And it crosses over into the sporting world. I am the first to say that I felt, especially in my prime, very badly managed because you're, you know, 22 year old. I'm sponsored. I was sponsored by Nike for about 10 years. I literally am a full-time athlete. Heaven flat, N literally no one to tell you like how to invest, what to invest, why to invest, how to manage your money, bank accounts, savings, all these things about putting different pots. Zero of that. I had to learn that on myself about 10 years later. 
And that is the world that we're in where I feel like, how are you coming out of how many years of education with no actual real concept of how to be a human being in this day and age? Like 2022 onwards, it's a mess. And people are struggling because they aren't equipped with skills. Just as you equipped right now, if you want to go down and say, right, mom, I want to go and run 100 meter open in April. We're going to have to train all winter. I'm going to say to you, right, this is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to eat. This is what I need you to do. You need to start stretching. I'm going to try and equip you so that when you get ready for that race, you know how to set your blocks up. You know how to go on your marks, get set and push off those blocks. You know exactly the phases you need to run. There's no point in you going, I'm going to run 100 meters and I go, right, I'll see you in April. Let's say you get on. But I'm going to show you to do CrossFit because that's not going to help you run that 100 metres. Yeah. I can teach you CrossFit for eight months and you come out, you run 100 metres and you're going like, so to pull your hamstring. And that's essentially for me what education is right now. And I think we have to take ownership of our own education. We have to be accountable. We have to take responsibility of our own education. It's the only way. We can't be reliant or dependent on all those things. We have to make sure that we are doing everything that we come within our power to get the results that we want to get. That's an amazing finish. I think that just sums up the fact that self-education is the result to any form of success. Like I don't even say that lightly. If you want to learn something, you can't sit there and say, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's not for me. That's just laziness. It's out there. Everyone can have it all. And there's so much opportunity. And your story, Monty, has been amazing. I've loved it. Thank Honestly, you. it's been such a cool podcast. And um, before we wrap it up, where can yeah. people go to connect? I mean, you're everywhere anyway. <laughs> but where can, where can people reach out to uh, connect and drop you a DM? Uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's my normal name, Monta Douglas. And Instagram is Monty Trackstar. I did think about changing that, but it's been there for how many years now? And apparently I can't. <laughs> everyone knows me as that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, guys, hit me up. Awesome. Thanks, Monty. <laughs> and everyone who's watched, thanks so much. And we'll see you all very soon.